Welcome to the Stoa. The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Welcome to the Dark Stoa. These evening events tend to deal with darker subjects and as a disclaimer, they could engender existential horror. So consider yourself warned. You can think of tonight's session as kind of a stoic group practice in negative visualization, in thinking about a negative outcome that may or may not, maybe is likely to happen in our futures and coming to terms with it emotionally. And tonight we're in for a treat. We have none other than Pat Ryan, who some have said is the most dangerous man on the internet. And he is talking about CRISPR, which is uh, this brave new world technology that I imagine some of you are familiar with that holds a lot of promise, but perhaps mostly existential threat. And we're going to learn a lot more about that in a moment. So the structure for tonight is basically, I'm going to hand it over to Pat in a moment, and he's going to take us through a presentation. And at the end of that, we'll have an opportunity to ask him a few questions. Um, so pay attention. And if you come up with questions along the way, feel free to throw them in the chat and I will speak them for you, or you can share them once we get to the end of the presentation. So without further delay, Pat, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Hi folks, thanks for the disclaimer, Daniel, I, I appreciate it. And uh, this is a topic that I have talked about endlessly for almost two decades. Uh, so I am just completely deadened by any possible shock value that happens from it. So please don't take my, my flippancy as arrogance here. I'm, I'm just fairly um, exhausted in terms of researching the possibilities of how this is going to pan out. <clears throat> um, and thank you for coming back for repeat visitors. Uh, I haven't scared you off yet. We'll, we'll try We'll see what we can do tonight. Um, CRISPR is a technology that allows one to inject DNA sequences into a cell. That's basically it, um, with one tiny difference. What I just described is exactly how a virus works. It lands on the surface membrane, breaks it through, deletes the DNA or blows it up, and then injects its own DNA to then turn the cell into a manufacturer for more viruses, rinse and repeat. What makes this different is that it doesn't blow away the host cell's DNA. It keeps most of it intact, the snippet that gets injected parses through the DNA, it finds exactly what you intend to remove, and then it injects what you intend to replace it with. So it's kind of like opening a book and ripping out a page and putting in your own page to change the story. You don't fundamentally destroy the book in the process, but you get some interesting fan fiction. Well, in this case, what happens is you end up with violating the great taboo of horizontal nuclear transfer which is something that nature has wisely forbade us from doing, but we have idiotically found a way around it. So this is definitely our destiny and we just got to ride the crazy train and see where it takes us. And so hopefully this will give you um, a realistic understanding of how us humans are going to, what I'm going to call, we're going to tower of Babel our own brains. Um, so before I begin, <clears throat> We're going to go through the history of why we even want to do these things. Um, it'll be as brief as I can make it, and I'll try to make it interesting. So without further preference, here we go. Share my screen. Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Da, da, da. CRISPR is art and other horrifying things we're probably going to do to each other. Welcome to your evolution where your DNA is as flexible as the contents of your hard drive. Um, we will no longer be on a line of evolution. We will now enter a crazy web that is almost impossible to predict. Uh, this poor little alien. It's going to be John in the future, wherever you are, John. 
So moving on, where do we start with CRISPR? Well, we actually start with Plato, surprisingly. Um, he wanted to create a society in which uh, the leaders of that society were the best possible leaders that people could have. Uh, he called them the guardians and they were voted by the auxiliaries uh, and the guardians were basically philosopher kings. So the, the guardians were people who guarded the city from external threats and itself and ensured its well-being. But how do you make the guardians care? Uh, how do you defeat the problem of greed and people making themselves enriched from the position of power they find themselves in? Well, Plato to the rescue, uh, he turns around and says, no, 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 wait a second. Um, what if we throw a yearly orgy and all these people come together, and they bump uglies and they get some kids. And then what we want to do instead, these are, these are, this is a summary of Plato, forgive me. Um, and what we're going to do is people we admire the most, the traits we're looking for the most, well, we're going to, we're going to make sure they breed the most. So this person is a good leader or this person was a good mathematician or this person is just really funny. Go ahead and pump out a bunch of kids within our guardian cast um, and we'll hedge our bets. So this is basically a hedging strategy to make sure you end up with kids that are competent based on uh, initial starting advantages as best as they could see it. They didn't have a concept of genes, but they did master animal breeding. So I guess they looked at it that way. Um, so this is like a really early form of eugenics, basically. Uh, this idea where you have um, selecting, controlling the, it, taking natural, taking the natural out of natural selection and having controlled selection. That's basically it. It's a basic tactic. That's all that's going on here. Um, and again, his reasoning was primarily to make sure that the leaders of the city were the best possible leaders because they didn't want corrupt leaders. They've, Plato hated democracy. He fucking hated democracy. He wanted nothing to do with it. He wanted it burned to the ground. And he, I mean, democracy killed his best friend. It's it soccer. They voted him to drink hemlock. So yeah, he hated the shit out of it. So he was trying to solve the fundamental problem of democracy by getting the best possible leaders. And this is where aristocracy is born, the very concept of it. Um, the Romans thought it was some, a good idea. Uh, they take a couple pieces of it themselves. Uh, so they come up with their, the laws of the 12 tables, which was very early Roman law uh, in, in, the, in the history books. Um, they decided it wasn't enough to, to make sure that all the leaders were smart and beautiful. We also got to kill the ugly kids too, because if you're going to go all the way with it, I mean, you got to get, you got to get both ends of it. If you're, if you're going for this eugenically selected kind of a society and maximizing your aristocracy, because if the, you, you've already picked for your best possible leaders in society, there's only so many people with genitals that you can possibly breed. You eventually run out of options. So you've hit maximum efficiency in your eugenic strategy. Now you got to start booting the losers. And this is where things go off the rails pretty quickly, as you can imagine. So the Europeans decide to LARP Crusader Kings II for the next 1,500 years uh, and do exactly what Plato suggested, where they go ahead and control who, which daughters married to who and which sons married to who. And this is primarily the Middle Ages for the most part. And everybody knows in Crusaders II, it's very important to turn the Pope gay because he'll absolve you of your sins and you always get away with it because he doesn't want his dirty secrets. And that's, that's, that is a ridiculous example of how this game ends up. It ends up in like this Middle Ages version of homosexual blackmail that just goes off the rails, unfortunately, pretty brutally. Um, and I think, I think Martin Luther had some beef about that too, about the corruption of the church. But this is all, again, this is all spawned from Plato's vision of a highly efficient uh, aristocracy. So Europeans thought it was a good idea and they just did it forever. Um, Things changed when a guy named Thomas Malthus uh, came along. He was an economist, and he was wise to understand the relationship between population and labor demand. No one had really knocked that out of the park quite like he did. So I'm gonna, this is a long document. Now th this is his words. This is Populations by, by Thomas Malthus. Um, so the, the highlighted section is basically he's making the case, he's saying, um, the poor are having children and it's interfering with their ability to, to better their lives because it's another mouth to feed. He has to labor harder um, and those, those type of arguments. But 
the next argument gets lost in the retelling of this. And it's an important point. Um, the, the sex drive is so strong that people are always increasing their population. Um, and as it constantly does this, uh, it causes the lower classes to distress. Uh, and the reason for that is, is yes, of course, it's more mouse to but it's actually, there's a meta reason beyond that, an economics reason. Um, because the more people you have, um, the more redundant labor you have. So instead of having uh, 20 farmers, you now have 200 farmers, but you only need like 10. So what happened to all the redundant labor? Well, they just kind of don't farm, which means they can't buy stuff, they can't eat, they can't use their skill and turn it to labor. You don't have a, a surplus of, of population and you don't have the ability to scale your productivity to those people because it's the 1600s. You can't just like spin up a machine to do it for you. Um, so th the population pressure causes pricing and labor to go down. So the cost of labor goes down as population goes up. The inverse is also true. As people are killed or displaced or exiled, um, there are so few of them that the price of their labor goes up. Um, and this is the key point that is always lost when discussing Malthus. Um, the invention of processes for shortening labor without the proportional extension of the market for the commodity, and particularly the difference between the nominal and real price of labor, a circumstance which has perhaps more than any other contributed to conceal this oscillation from common view. So what he was trying to do is reveal that, hey, uh, it isn't just greedy kings and princes being inept, and it isn't just poor people just being stupid, it's the very population mechanic itself that's driving poverty. And that was his argument. Um, and it's a, he's not entirely wrong. I, if you look at it from that, if you look at it from that side, I don't side with the Malthusians for, for starters. I don't like them as people. I don't like the culture that they end up always going towards. It, it, it becomes too nihilistic. Um, and it's celebrated for that nihilism. And I just, maybe it's a taste thing, but I just don't like it. Um, but in this case, he's making a very solid point regarding the relationship of population and labor. Um, and then, uh, let's see, what does he say here? In effect, on the railroad price during this period, it gets worse and worse, but the farmers and capitalists are growing rich from the, uh, yeah, right. So in this case, there's now a negative side effect. It's almost as if you want more poor people so that the farmers have more cheap labor and so that the capital investments get better returns on their investments. So now there's this additional negative incentive on top of population rates exploding. Uh, it's, you want the poor to have as many babies as possible. And so this is, this is Thomas Malthus's argument against him uh, as best as he can. Um, and you know, he finally realizes the superior power of population cannot be checked without producing misery or vice. So even if you try to make these poor people to stop dumping out kids for their own benefit, uh, you either have to kill them or you make them, you pay them to not burn down their city and they, they, they spend that money on, I don't know, being bums, who knows. Um, and these are things you don't want in your society either. Uh, sorry, this is, go away, thank you. Um, an ample portion of these two bitter ingredients in the cup, uh, in the cup of human life. And the continuance of the physical causes that seems to have produced them bear too convincing a testimony. So he, he realizes the catch-22 of his own revelation. He says, oh, crap, more people are happening, but if I try to do anything, I'm probably going to get killed or make the situation worse. So he sees the crazy train, and he knows there's no stopping it. And he points it out to, to good effect. This surprisingly goes immediately to Charles Darwin. Now this link isn't really well taught in, in evolution studies. Um, Charles Darwin, he wrote Origin of Species because he read Malthus. And this is from his own words, um, from the autobiography of, of Charles Darwin. I happened to read for the amusement Malthus on population and being well prepared to appreciate the struggle for existence which everywhere goes on from long continued observation of the habits of animals and plants it at once struck me that under these circumstances, favorable variations would tend to be preserved. And get ready for it, folks. 
and unfavorable ones destroyed, the result would be the formation of a new species. Okay, let's sit this back. This guy read Malthus, and he discovered a way to create new species from it. Right, the what? How did anybody, how could that have possibly been the takeaway from Malthus? Well, unfortunately, he tells us. The solution, as I believe, is that the modified offspring of all dominant increasing forms tends to be adapted to mainly and highly diversified place in the economy of nature. Okay, so here's why this matters. This is how he's able to go from the population oscillation that Malthus was talking about and then say, oh, it's the economy of nature that we haven't accounted for. There is an economy to nature. There is a behavior of energy sharing resource distribution that's been going on in this background. I can't quite put my finger on it, but it's there. And what Malthus is talking about is also seen in the breeding habits of other animals. So the breeding of humans is affecting their distribution of demand for their labor and their ability and their well living. And we're also seeing the same population mechanic play out amongst animals and plants. So he's able to read Malthus and extract that unique insight. And it's because of that, that he's able to publish the origin of species. So Malthus was a key influence to Charles Darwin. And that's not really well researched, um, but it's right there, it's his own words. And so he's able to see um, the, the, this is humanity's attempt to try and understand population mechanics in a very clumsy way. And Darwin saw in animals, Malthus saw in economics, and when you merge those two together, you realize economics was the actual constraint. The resource distribution was the actual constraint. And because of that constraint, we're now able to understand better the pressures that caused those oscillations that Malthus was talking. Charles Darwin's cousin was John Galton. And Galton was a big supporter of Darwin, and Darwin was a big supporter of Galton. Now this, at this point, we're in, Victor I think, 1800s, late 1800s Britain, Victorian Britain. So Galton takes a look at Darwin and takes a look at Malthus and goes, if we know that the population is oscillating, we can either sit there and be a slave to it or we can do something about it. So this is the birth of the progressive movement. The modern progressive movement starts with John Galton. And the reason, so the formation of the blue church, this is the birth of the blue church right here. The modern blue church, all the tactics they embrace and everything they do starts with Galton. Because if you read that box, that's his, that's his actual words. What he's saying is he's making the case for the world we live in right now. And he's explaining how you engineer the times that they're in at that point to get this world we have today, a world which um, uh, would be one in which society was not costly. So there's, there's an abundance of price pressures that drive the prices down, where incomes were chiefly derived from professional sources. So you don't have um, uh, scumbags and, and uh, bankers all over the place. You are, a, you are in profession, you are being producing something of value. Um, and not much through inheritance. So you, the elimination of kings and, and the church effectively, no more inheritance stuff, where every lad had a chance at showing his abilities. And if he's highly gifted, see first-class education and can enter the professional life by liberal help of exhibitions and scholarships, which he has gained in his early youth. The ability to, uh, an abundant, he's, he's painting the picture for this abundance of opportunity that he wants to create, you know, where the marriage is held in a high honor, honor as it was in Jewish times. Um, where the pride of the race was encouraged. And even here, he makes the footnote. He doesn't mean the, the, the race sciences. He doesn't, that's not what he's talking about. He even makes that footnote. He makes that very clear. Um, uh, where the weak would find welcome and refuge in celibate monasteries and sisterhoods. So even those who aren't part of his plan still have something to find meaning from. So he's taking, he's basically, he's making this political stumping speech, effectively. He's taking Darwin... He's taking Darwin's influence from Malthus and he's forming this into a political discussion. He's saying, how do we organize our society in a way to get these wonderful outcomes? And he's saying, from Darwin, we are able to find a starting point. Sorry, let me get this little, little doodad out of the way. 
And he's saying that he's comparing the, the participation of society to cells, um, where the cells are constantly interacting and it's a, a, it's a stochastic randomness, which appears what's going on, but quite the opposite's going on. They're very well organized and they don't need to be organized from a, from a central power. Um, and he's using Darwin as like this model that that's what's already going on. So we should probably emulate that because that's what nature's already laid out for us. Now you have to keep in mind, this is, this is Galton, this is Victorian Britain. This is the birth of the blue church. This is the, 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 the humanist material, a materialist progressive faith starts here in this argument. The idea that we can shift populations to then shift society to then build a society we want to build. Um, and we don't need a central power to do it. He's out there basically saying Bitcoin, but for, but for populations, you don't need a central bank. You don't need a king or a pope. Um, biology is doing this without any of that shit. So we should be able to do that too. Um, this, was, this was a very charged argument for uh, certain sects of Christianity at that time um, and would obviously piggyback off of the Marxism that was becoming more and more popular of this era as well. Okay, that's a lot. And then he goes forth to basically say, yeah, like uh, Darwin's awesome forever and fuck yeah, let's do him forever. So at this point, the Europeans are starting to say, hey, they're inching towards the uncomfortable reality where they're like, let's start doing breeding programs. Because Galton is effectively stating he wants to create this public breeding program in the name of health, in the name of the health of the society. I, I, didn't, I didn't go into what Galton was saying there, but he's looking, he's, he's citing Darwin for a reason. He doesn't believe in the idea of creating, Galton does not believe in the idea of creating laws or ideas of making dictates. He's saying if we just intelligently and cleverly steer the breeding that's already going on, then we're going to get this society. So it's a rehash of, of Plato's Philosopher Kings. And uh, the underlying principle, of course, is uh, to show that science can triumph over religion, which is the drive of a lot of the blue church and progressives from this period onward. Um, now, simultaneously, th th this whole, he, Galton is laying the groundwork for a holy war against society itself, against the organic um, formation of society. He's, he's laying the ground to say we're going to change the society in a way that's better for everyone involved and we're going to do it one penis and one vagina at a time. Um, meanwhile, somewhere else in Germany, uh, a bunch of smart dudes get really confused by dice and they accidentally invent probability. That sounds like a hell of a segue, but it's deeply related. So Pascal and Fermat, uh, they solve gambling. Um, there's, a, there's a funny problem they encounter where if you and I decide to play a gambling game where we're rolling dice and the game suddenly ends because a bunch of assholes come in and you know they chase us out because they don't want us playing. Well, how do we figure out the split of the pot that we've already played into? Do I split it 50-50? Do you get more because you won more? It's an uncomfortable way to like how do you fairly figure out how this game was going to resolve if the game is entirely powered by random forces. That's it's, it's like an insurance problem, basically. Well, that's where the concept of the expected value comes from. So these two guys, they decided to say, hey, we're going to solve this problem about figuring out the probability of how these dice were going to turn out at this time, and then the payout will be divided along that number instead. And that's the fairest distribution that you can do in a game that is driven entirely by randomness. Uh, of course, because they solved this problem, they solved gambling, which inevitably led to casinos, which from casinos leads to Donald Trump. So these guys were making America great way back when. Um, meanwhile, from here, Mendel decides to say, hey, this probability thing, that's pretty interesting. Let's apply it to heredity, which is a word I always struggle with. Um, so heredity back then was like trees and branches and so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. Um, they were like linear lines of who was who. Uh, Mendel is like, that's stupid. I, I think probability probably has something to do with this. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a whack at that. Uh, and he comes up with uh, this little concept. Move this there. 
um, where he, he starts very small in a way that he can control and predict. He starts with plants. He says, if I put this pollen in this pistol, then I get these properties. And if I mix them in these ways, then I get these properties. So he's able to apply like set theory probability to the outcomes of breeding for very simple beings. Uh, starts with plants, they move to very tiny animals afterwards. Now, this is revolutionary in and of itself. No one had ever done this before. In fact, because no one had ever done this before, his work wasn't even understood. History almost completely did not even come across this guy. It was by total randomness, ironically, given the nature of probability, that his works were even found. It's almost as if, 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 the, if the simulation theory is true, the simulation becomes self-aware of the moment this guy's works become found. If there was anything that could have changed how this simulation would have rolled out, burying his work would have fundamentally changed everything in human history. Um, but because of this discovery, um, he's able to then take the concept of heredity and say, it's not just kings and princes and, and causality, there's some randomness here, and we can actually predict the randomness by using probability. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a rocket leap. That is a quantum leap in thinking. Um, now this guy, <laughs> this fucking guy, like, I could speak on this man for hours. This guy is fundamentally insane, but he's also incredibly charming. His name is JBS uh, Haldane. Now, Haldane, I'm going to talk about him, and then I'm going to explain why what he did was important, and the two things have nothing in common. Um, so, so Haldane was, <laughs> he was the only person who loved World War I. All right, we're just going to start there, right? He loved World War I. This guy could not get enough of shooting Germans. This guy fucking loved it. He would, he would, he would not get authorized. He'd crawl out of the trenches with his mortar team and just dump mortars randomly on Germans. And he's laughing the whole time. He couldn't get enough of it. This guy, he swore that gas was a better weapon than, than uh, bullets. Um, th this guy was destined to live a life of just total stochastic excitement with no rhyme or reason. It was, he's like the original Joker. Um, it turns out that a brain that is able to process such madness and keep sane uh, is also a brain that can come up with some pretty fantastic fucking thinking. Uh, and he's able to merge Mendel's probability with Galton's political utopia. So what he's able to do is he's able to research linking how genetics, uh, on the linkage and the mapping function, which is a technical term, um, he's able to say, okay, we can find that this trait from these parents is passed to these mice. So he's able to take Mendel and apply it to mammals. He does it with mice first, but it gets, it progressively goes to more and more stuff. So because of this, he's actually the foundation of population genetics. Uh, he, he finds out a way to take distribution that Mendel was talking about and, and fulfill the goals of Galton in the process. Now, most people have never even heard of this guy. And there's a reason for that, because he's batshit insane for starters, and two, he was a diehard fucking Stalinist all the way up to 1975. <laughs> it's, it's nuts. <laughs> You've never heard of this guy, and now you know why. Uh, but I, I recommend reading him. He's incredibly charming. He's an incredibly uh, funny dude. Uh, and he's also a goddamn genius. Um, but his work was able to bridge... Galton's dream and Mendel's discovery and actually bring the uh, Plato's eugenics to the masses. So moving on, all of this is the backdrop for the 20th century. And I believe the 20th century can be summed up as the holy wars to control the evolution of evolution. And I say holy wars and I mean the, uh, the programming term where you have people who have opinions about a certain open source project and they're like, oh, well, I'm gonna fork the project to do this. And the other guy says, well, I'm gonna fork the project to do this. And you have a holy war and there's no reason the forking exists anyway, but people just fucking do it. Um, and that's pretty prominent in Linux, but that's what I mean by holy wars. So to control the evolution of evolution, right? So it's kind of recursive, but it's important because evolution itself is this process that's organically going on. So you wanna control and iterate this process, which is the evolution of evolution. So. Just to recap, everything I've been talking about has been treating the evolution of evolution as policy. So we start with Plato, control the breeding of the elites, 
middle ages where that's the elite say fine sounds like a good plan to me and they do it forever you have malthus who says ah but we also got to control the breeding of the poor darwin says hey we can make new species through breeding that's cool and then you have galton who says we're going to systematically control the breeding in the name of public health so this is the this is the intellectual foundation behind mass applied eugenics right and so this is where the holy wars start because once people they all agree here to like okay that's a that's an intellectual line that i agree with but now that we're here who controls the breeding who's it going to be which philosopher king is it going to be well margaret singer thought that all women should control the breeding programs a, a dolphin hortler whose name i can't say uh, thought the state should control all the breeding programs. Henry Ford thought the oligarchs should control it. This guy you've never heard of either, Lysenko. Lysenko is the reason why Russia's genetics program are in a complete disarray. They still haven't recovered from his idiocy. He thought the people should control all breeding programs. Then you have hippies just running around saying, fuck this, hit the brakes, get nature have a shot at this. You know, it did good enough, it should you know, keep going. Then you have Craig Ventner, who is, you never want to be against this guy in a fight. This guy will wreck your life. He says the market should be in control of the breeding programs. Then you have Josiah, um, last name always escaped me, uh, Zaner, I think it is. He says the individual should at least have a stake in all of these breeding programs if they're all over the place. Um, and then, of course, everybody's favorite deep state black ops spook, who certainly didn't kill himself, uh, he thought that him and his clan should control the breeding programs, and he funded the hell out of that stuff, and one day all that's going to come to the forefront. But he was big on this stuff, too. He was super big on this stuff. So this is how the Holy Wars basically evolved to control the evolution of evolution. And all of these guys were wrong. They were all wrong, every single one of them. But they weren't wrong because they were stupid. Uh, they were wrong because they were limited. They were too busy trying to look at Galton's vision purely from a policy standpoint, applying a utilitarian, applying the, the maximum amount of benefit um, with the least amount of burden uh, and the least amount of cost. So they, they were trying to play this out through the, the, the games of human law and, and human policy making. Well, that changed around 1950. That, well, that changed with Mendel. That starts with the change of Mendel. So evolution of evolution is not just policy, it's also technology. What I mean by that is we got the, the random brothers over here. They, they figured out how to make casinos. Um, then Mendel comes along by, by a random twist of fate. His works get picked up and worked on. Um, and he figures out how to predict the breeding outcomes of plants and animals, which leads to science's wackiest human being ever. Um, coming around with breeding of humans, which then Watson and Crick, where they figured out DNA. Right, so here's where we go from policy to technology. We're taking all, we're increasing the, the resolution of our prediction power. And we get to the father of the Human Genome Project, where they mapped human DNA. And now we're finally here, the inventor of CRISPR, where we can modify the DNA of living beings on the fly. This is critical. Because while CRISPR itself, there are problems. There are a million problems with CRISPR. It's probably not even going to be the answer. But because we figured out how to do it, it we will figure out ways to improve it. Whether the final solution is CRISPR, or whether it's something else, it doesn't matter. This has been tasted. This possibility has been tasted, and that's enough for people to keep trying to refine on it. Um, and this is where it changes because policy failed for the exclusive reason that their only means of controlling for the outcome they wanted was through actual organic natural breeding. But here we can decouple breeding from um, the execution required to get the Galton's vision. You can leave sex completely out of the picture now and you can still get Galton's vision. This is a mind blowing possibility that we have the unfortunate timing to be born at the beginning of. You definitely want to be at the end of this. You don't want to be at the beginning. Um, and let me explain why. What have we done without this crazy technology, right? What have we actually done to breeding where we didn't have the ability to do all this magic shit? Well, when death is valuable, um, we have found ways to breed animals into apparently Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
So what this means is we, we're bulking these critters up because death is valuable to them. You can only kill them once. And so you want to maximize the amount of meat that you're going to get from the kill. So when death is the primary source of value generation, you're going to, you're going to make these super freaks because you can only kill them once. Now, what happens when life is valuable? Now you might think, oh, well, life is valuable. That sounds good. You're gonna make the best, you're gonna make fucking sexy elves all over the place. No, you're gonna make fucking mutts. Started as a wolf, look at that thing. It's like torture in a genome. But that's what we did. We did that. They didn't do that. Life was valuable. We wanted these critters around us. And this is what we did. And what you're looking at here, this is, this is a glimpse of the future for the human species. We're gonna do that shit to us. I will put money on it, we will do that shit to ourselves. Because life is valuable. And here's, again, evolution of evolutionist policy. Uh, we have the Chinese killing every baby girl they could find. Uh, people who are intentionally selecting their mating habits based on eugenic data that they were able to collect, whether it's accurate or not. Trying to figure out who's Jewish and who isn't. This damn thing right here, this... <laughs> This thing was like, this is like the carpet bombing solution to what Galton wanted. For guys probably don't know this, but this is a, this is a birth control uh, dispenser. So this thing was just like, it, it, it was just throw them into a society and fuck all this, see what happens. This was just like the carpet bombing approach to get the answer you were looking for. Um, and oh my God, it's fuck. You ended up experiencing all of the things that Malthus warned us would happen. And we just didn't give a shit. We were so desperate to have a solution. We just threw fucking this at it. Um, population control propaganda. You've seen this, like all oh, there's too many people on the earth. We got to stop it. It's going to get out of hand. We got to do something about this. So this starts happening all of which generates this wonderful little line of population growth. Expected to go down. Uh, this, of course, is false. The numbers do go up for nations that don't practice it. Only the advanced nations do this stuff, this self-termination stuff, um, because we're too busy trying to chase Galton. We want that perfect society, and if we have to eliminate ourselves to do it, so be it, and that's what we're aiming for. We're trying to eugenically reach a eugenic equilibrium. And this is what humans have done without CRISPR. So we have fucked with population mechanics as much as possible throughout most of the 20th century. Uh, and if you're looking for reasons why the 20th century was so incredibly unstable, here you go, you're looking at it. The, the, the holy wars for the evolution of evolution. Um, but now, because of CRISPR, it's not gonna be holy wars anymore. It's gonna be a race. It's gonna be a race to control the evolution of evolution. So again, here's how CRISPR works. Lands on a cell, says, hey, little cell, let me squirt some DNA in you. Instead of blowing out your DNA, I'm like, ah, I'm gonna scan your DNA. I don't wanna, uh, oh, I wanna replace this. Like, oop, this spot, kick it out, throw this in. Boop, keep going, we're good. So all the DNA keeps going, the new DNA is in, this whole cell goes through mitosis, and then poof, you have new DNA. Which means I could pop some shit in me, and if it spreads through, all, if the virus spreads through me or the virus delivery mechanism spreads through me, I will replace the DNA in all of my cells eventually. So it's like hot swapping my genetic code on the fly. Um, and by the way, this CRISPR, $140. That's it for a test kit. So this is cheap. And it's only going to get cheaper. So what we've done is because we no longer need population mechanics to do this type of research, we can now focus on the individual level, which gives us phylogenetic efficiency as an OODA loop. So observe, orient, direct, uh, decision, act. Um, so start with, we observe the sequences, we look at all the letters and the distributions, uh, we reconstruct the evolutionary histories from here, so we get a timeline, so we can figure out, oh, okay, here's how these things are going. We can learn more about evolutionary processes, so we can make some theories about if we alter this DNA, what do we get? And then we, you know, we check our work and then we come back and we loop around, 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 we go, right? Uh, so we go to empirical, we go to theoretical, we're bouncing around epistemologically, we're figuring out how we can start modifying the long-term development of these species branches, these species trees. Now, we, can, we have only been bound by population mechanics to do that. Bing! 
throw CRISPR in the mix, now we can get down to the individual. Oh, and by the way, because we're talking efficiency, now we have economics. And I'll be able to walk into this and you'll see where the problems immediately start. So the evolution of evolution as efficiency, efficiency will close because there are multiple metrics of efficiency. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna present six models of efficiency in the order in which I believe they're going to play out over the next hundred years. So CRISPR should aim for the least amount of computational complexity. This is known as a uh, analysis of algorithms. It's a big O notation in computer science land. So what this is, is you're trying to create a CRISPR that does the maximum amount of uh, computation with the least amount of complexity in this case. Uh, and once you select for that, you will have achieved a level of efficiency for the CRISPR delivery system itself. So you will have figured out the easiest way to compress it down for mass production, right? So that's the first thing you wanna do. Next thing is you should find the lowest cost for that production. So now that you have the theoretical means of the complexity down to its least amount, now we wanna mass produce this stuff. So we gotta figure out what the price is. We gotta figure out how do we manufacture that least amount of complexity? How do we mass produce it? What are our techniques, our materials needed, trainings needed, you know, the entire price discovery mechanism writ large. From there, you wanna do um, allative um, efficiencies, which means you wanna now talk about the quality of the CRISPR. Because now we're talking about, before we were just talking about, can we do it? Yes, can we get it cheap? Yes, okay. Now, because we can do it cheap, there's gonna be a lot of competition. What is the quality of my CRISPR? What is the marginal benefit I can provide the consumers relative to the marginal cost of production? How do I differentiate myself and say that the CRISPR I'm providing is way better than that asshole's CRISPR over there? He's a fucking moron. My shit's great. So now we're playing this, this uh, competitive game in, in the economic space. So then we eventually, the, the, we get the Pareto rules where we figure out the Pareto frontier and we're saying, well, um, now we're shifting into this uh, kind of this political space where where we want to achieve the maximum adoption until no one else is made worse off. So, so the, as this game evolves, you're going to discover the Pareto frontier where no more further tinkering to this is actually going to improve this. The Pareto frontier will just cut it off right there on the spot and you won't be able to get any more efficiency. So all of these things combined will draw that Pareto line out. And that will be the end of the game of efficiency. Now we go to the game of meta efficiency. This is where the frontier and the scientists and the, and the brilliant thinkers and the real sexy uh, marketing of CRISPR as a great, wonderful discovery, as this collective thing we're all doing, the future's gonna be so bright. As soon as it hits this hard Pareto frontier, the whole narrative switches pretty much overnight. Now we talk about planned obsolescence and rebounding demand. So now we're talking about, hmm, I'm already getting my CRISPR down to price to unit economics. I need to maximize the amount of demand permanently. So how can I put CRISPR in a place to where if, um, if demand for it goes down, the price still goes up? How can I get it in a place where demand goes up, the price still goes up? Now this is called Jevons paradox in, in uh, economics. It's the idea of oil. Um, oil is a different type of commodity because the more you consume it, the more you need it. And the reason for that is because without oil, you need donkeys and slaves to do stuff. So in order for me to do work, I need to, excuse me, I need to consume oil to drive my ass to work, which is going to, assuming a factory, it's going to need oil to run. So the more I'm consuming oil, the more work I can do that requires more demand for oil down the line. And so this creates this Jevons paradox where the demand for it goes up, the cost goes up, the demand for it goes down, the cost goes up. Some sneaky, terrible human being is going to find a way to bind CRISPR to this behavior. And when that happens, all bets are off because then you can talk about CRISPR purely returning, maximizing shareholder returns at that point. It has nothing to do with quality. It has nothing to do with um, public health or anything. It's just all the fucking rail, all the fucking wheels are off, and it's just crazy train forever. Um, so this is the, the order I think the efficiency pathing will go. It should take about a hundred years. Um, once you get here, just try and find a way off the planet because it just doesn't get better from here. Um, so what does this look like? What does the marketing look like as these efficiency games play out? What does Gucci think about this? What does Louis Vuitton think about this? You think they're gonna sit on the sidelines? I don't think so. 
Let me just give you an example of this ad and read it to you in the, the sexy voiceover voice I used to do back when I was 20. The Gosling West Johnson Artisanal Gene Series by Gucci. You'll have, you'll have the, the stoic demeanor of, of, of Gosling, the creative talent of, of Kanye West and, and the, the brutish physique of, of The Rock Johnson over there. All in one thing, and oh, by the way, you want this for your babies. Maybe you want it for yourself, it's crisp. I could dump it in me right now, right? So now we're talking jeans as commodity, gene edits as commodity. So now we're talking CRISPR is fully exposed to the full force of marketing at this point. So all the artists and the creatives and the people who are experimenting with it. Um, I mean, I tried to, like a couple of years ago, I tried to start a Kickstarter for this process. <laughs> it got banned in like 30 minutes. <laughs> Nobody wanted to, wanted to allow me to, to start collecting the DNA of these celebrities and selling them to CRISPR. Uh, apparently, I was way too ahead of my time. Um, but uh, this is the type of marketing you'll definitely be seeing. And think about it from the perspective of everyone involved. On its surface, it looks like everyone actually benefits from this at first. I imagine a, 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 a poor family in India. Right? They make like $2 a day or whatever, right? Well, they may look at this and say, if I was more like these people, then I would have an advantage. So there's a huge incentive for these people to then dump CRISPR in themselves. And I'm going to be the Indian rock. It's going to make some great beats and let's fly for all the ladies, right? That's what I want. That's going to maximize my chances in the game. Yeah, but you're not the only one doing it. Everybody's doing it. Billions of people are doing it. So, so any type of perceived benefit, if everybody can beat Kanye West, then what Kanye West does doesn't matter. It's, it's now a cheap commodity because everybody can do it. If it's genetically, you know, predispositioned, whatever, However, it expresses, of course, is a question of nature versus nurture. I get that. Um, but for marketing reasons, and I'm, streaking, I'm speaking about marketing perception, that's how it's going to be sold, and that's how it's going to be bought. It's that promise is going to be made. People are going to buy it in bulk. Whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. Um, and then from the production manufacturing side, okay, now I can pay back my investors because I'm hitting this markets at scale. Uh, eventually, people start making policies to give subsidies to these producers, say, hey, come to my nation and make some you know, superhumans as you promise you can. Uh, and then we'll, we'll subsidize and we eat some of the risk to, to incentivize it further. Um, that's just one example. I think we looked at Kanye enough. Moving on. What about the fashion industry? That's not a tumor. That's a CRISPR fad. Look what I can do to my skin. Aren't I cool? What kind of status games can we play here? It's going to drive. Marketing is going to reach here. It's going to push the whole thing. We're already starting to see artists playing around with the concept. This is Patricia Pacini. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know, my Italian's terrible. But here is an example of what appears to be obvious animal features being grafted onto humanoid types of beings. There are, this is a favored artist of very elite people, by the way. If you look up this name, you're going to see some stuff. Obviously, a bat nose, enlarged flipper like hands, one foot, cleft palate, looks a little bit like a seal because of the tail. Obviously, dog based features. Some fucking weird me. I don't even know what that is. Belongs in Mortal Kombat. But what you're seeing now, this is an example of, of gene punk. So you know what cyberpunk is and you know what steampunk is. What's gene punk? Gene punk is just, I'm gonna intentionally trash my genome. Like, you know, you get tattoos, you wanna be a badass. I'm gonna look like a literal fucking monster now because yeah, because I hate my dad. And you're gonna see that and that's gonna happen. And the artists are already experimenting with what this visually looks like. That's some, that's some damn good skin tone, I gotta say for art. First time I saw it, I thought they were actually real. I thought they were an actual chimera. Um, but this is, this is on the table too. It's not just the sexy stuff. It's the monsters too. So where does all of this art lead us to? All of this art and marketing. It goes to memes controlling genes. Instead of natural, instead of breeding and mating as the primary means of getting the maximum amount of genetic advantage for your distribution, whoever controls the means the memes will be able to control that distribution all the same. You'll be breeding out of it entirely. So you get the little Pepe's running around doing his Pepe thing. The bang, right? Uh, you know, 
oh, we're going to buy T-shirts of Pepe. We're going to buy tattoos of Pepe, some merch. And whatever gene edits you got, bro, throw them on top. No problem. I want that fucking frog look. So someone crispers up some stuff because there's obvious demand for it. You get the Pepe meme gene from 300 bucks, whatever. And then poof. Now what you've done is we've taken the distribution of, of, of human uh, phylogenetics or phylogenetics and we've attached mimetic gene markers throughout the human species. We'll be able to see the effect of advertising in our own genome. That's terrifying. <laughs> That's absolutely fucking terrifying. Uh, but this will be the primary means in which the eugenicists will go. This is the cheapest way you can do it because you don't need to control the entire production system of CRISPR. That some, some eggheads are going to play that game of efficiency, of efficiency. It's these guys. These are the guys who are going to control the distribution of what humanity's future is at the genomic level. And they will do so in an extremely unaccountable manner. Um, because once hyper-consumer practices start touching the stuff, then, pfft, I mean, I'm walking you through it. You see what it's going to be like. So now, aside from making mutants and, and more The Rock Johnsons, we're going to cross the threshold where we start figuring out if we play with this gene, we can start also changing our brains. I call this the gene drive of, of Babel. So like the Tower of Babel, but it's the gene drive of Babel. Um, the humanists, they, this, is, this is the petulance of these people. They, they think they can quantize belief, right? This is all about quantizing belief so they can prove that there is no divine. They want to say that, uh, oh, well, uh, I have modified the gene, which has changed your connectome. And so all of your free will is actually just an elaborate uh, a tree, and there's no free will, and uh, Westworld's right. Right? That's, that's what they're trying to go for. Um, and, that's, and they have the, the efficiency of economy backing them. They have the culture backing them by the time they reach this point. So we'll naturally tip into this space. Um, and it won't be tough. All you have to do is tell any expecting mother, hey, you want a super baby? You want your kid to be fucking intelligent? You want a high IQ baby? There, there's a marketing. I'm done. I'm a fucking genius. That's it, right? So I'm rich. Of course, everyone's going to say, who's going to want to have a dumb fuck? Like, it's, eh, it's, you know, on one hand, you're going to have your mean IQ, IQ people, you know, some people buy into that, some people don't, but whatever you're using to measure your intelligence capabilities, um, you're going to see that shift heavily once the hyper-marketing starts. What does that result into? I don't know what it results into. I don't fucking know, but I tell you what will happen. Once you cross that threshold, we start fundamentally undoing the one thing we've been relying on the entire time. And our story doesn't end this way. The hor horrible stuff I'm talking about doesn't end this way, by the way. And I'm going to explain to you why. So let's just assume that you and myself and, and everyone we know, they are baseline homo sapiens. They are, they are the homo sapiens who have derived organically from the evolution process. Um, and now we have what I'm going to call neurological derivatives. Um, so those neurological derivatives that I'm going to focus on are emotions. Let's start there, right? So, I have emotions, I'm a very sensitive guy, and I feel stuff, and I do stuff, and it affects my behavior. I, I get, I burn my hand, I'm like, ah, fuck, or I see something sad and I cry, whatever. I have emotions, right? I'm gonna start here. These emotions determine social interactions. So if I emote to you and I'm mad, it's gonna change the outcome of the social interaction. And if you emote with a smile, it's gonna change the outcome of the social interaction. So these drive these. These social interactions, we collaboratively figure out which ones are good and which ones are bad, and we come up with a reward system of which ones we want to promote and which ones we want to get rid of, and we call that culture. So these are like efficiencies we're building, right? And this in turn leads to morality because culture isn't enough. Culture is just for the present, for the operational generation, the generation that's alive. I want to, I want to take my lessons learned here, and I want to preserve them through time. I want my kids to have some of these cultural mores as well because there's some pretty good efficiencies here I figured out so you don't have to fall into the common pit traps surrounded at this level. So I want to bake this in, right? Which in turn leads to ethics, which is the exploration of all of this stuff and how they're all related. So it blows up after that once you get to ethics and we, and we keep examining, you know, what is, what is, you know, you can apply ethics to anything, right? 
So all of these things we're doing, these neurological derivatives we're engaging in, we actually deeply depend upon for our base ability to communicate. Um, and these arguably lead into the civil structures we are designing. It, our neurological derivatives, uh, they absolutely form religion. Legality, uh, the system of who owns what, what is fair, what is not fair. Finance, do, uh, who do I owe? Can I even comprehend the mathematics behind the contract that I'm uh, obligating myself towards? Uh, the science itself, uh, can I, a super brain out there trying to figure out reality? Well, I mean, bacteria didn't send rocket ships into space, right? So, so instead of looking at civilization as a byproduct of our activity, which human action, uh, homo, economic, homo economist says we should do, um, instead I look at civilization as a reflection of our neurological derivative. These are the things we come up with um, and the structure of these things are deeply dependent upon all of us having the same these. Because the moment you start introducing people who don't have the same emotions as everyone else, the rest of this shit doesn't even make sense. So if I strike fear from your emotional capacity and I apply that to an entire nation, you're going to come up with a culture and a morality and an ethics system that is fundamentally different than everyone else. And as a result, upstream or downstream, you're going to have totally different religions and totally different legal systems. So this is the baseline. We've all had the benefit of having this shared part right here. We all have roughly the same emotions. Um, of course, within here, each one of these develop their own models and assumptions, traditions and projections, but it's all derivative of this. So what happens if we start fucking with this because we're making these? Well, let's find out. It's a baseline human that we've been exploring. And oh no, it's the ultra humanist ecoclave. These people are the, let's, uh, let's imagine a hilarious future where the, the blue church has the, uh, the shit kicked out of them and they lick their wounds and run away. Um, they realize that perhaps trying to teach people about the values of their enlightenment ordeals um, is a bit too expensive and risky. So instead they just start coding their ethos into people at the genomic level. Why deal with propaganda if I can make drones that reflect everything I want? So now I got these humans who are afraid to touch trees because they might harm them. They don't, you know, they don't want to throw away trash. They have an irrational fear of that. No, I'm, I'm fucking with their brain to limit their options so I can then fulfill whatever my ideology is. So now I'm taking what the baseline humans have made by modifying um, the genome and then the connectome and I'm coding my ideology into biology itself, the same way that I put memes into genes. Say the unified Korean cl uh, clave happens. See, the North and the South, we get some nationalists in here, right? Not just all blue church. Let's say it's, uh, you get some Koreans in there and they're like, ah, North and South, geez, this is a mess. I don't want to live in fear anymore. Let's go make some babies that are a little bit of both. You know, it's, it's, however they define that. They don't, of course, they don't resolve the geopolitical tension of the region, but they're already making people who are demanding it. Like, we are unified. They have a they have an extreme amount of dopamine, for example, or you know they they have this this heavy uh, expansion definition of what familial bonds should be. You start tinkering with the brain, completely possible. It's the slavery reparations claim. Let's say uh, uh, the Karens of the world. They're really uh, they really don't like slavery, and they feel really bad, and they and their babies just aren't black enough, and they want to. They just want to. They just want to write the wrongs of history, man. They just, there you go. Now my baby's black enough. So I'm in the fight now. So now you have this like signaling element. In addition to memes and your genes, now you have ideological signaling all over your genome. Uh, we've already covered the, the I hate dad gene punks. You've seen those. Um, you're going to see a lot of gene trash coming out of here. It's going to be wild. It's a wacky, wacky scene. Um, then why, why let all the fun for the ideologues? Let's get some corporations in here. That's the, the PepsiCo super babies. So why, why drink soda uh, if it doesn't make your baby super babies? Fuck, that, that seems like a market loss. I don't want to just rot my teeth. I want my kids to be fucking superhuman. I just drink this can of soda and poof, them kids are at it. Louis Vuitton summer race. And now you got fashion back in the mix, right? And it's this, they, they, uh, 
you know, it's this summer, you know, have your jeans look like this. And it's, you know, it's, and then you have like versions of it. Iterate, it's, 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 I hope I'm conveying the madness of the situation. Um, that fuck it, you might even have a rogue AI. That something's out there making memes. It could start a strange, crazy cult. And it's just fucking with genes on purpose to, to maximize its ability to keep people in its belief system so it can feed resources to it. It's totally doable. And then, of course, the Neanderthal claim. Why deal with humans? Because 22 before us, it's bringing Neanderthals back. Why not? Now, I've, I think I've successfully made my point here. Um, now, I guess all that remains is how true is any of this? How am I taking this little Cas9 thing and extrapolating all of these possibilities? Uh, maybe I just have an overactive imagination. Um, that's fair. So let's look at what's, what I've been doing. This is the Neanderthals. We've already made them. There's 6,000 of them. We brought Neanderthal brains back. It took a long nap, but we brought them back. You've all seen Jurassic Park. You know, you get the, get the DNA from the, uh, from the mosquito, right? It's trapped in the amber. Put it in the stem cell and then away you go, right? Well, that's what we did here. We went to a, uh, went to a Neanderthal exhibit, scraped some DNA off the bones, plugged the DNA into a human stem cell with the help of CRISPR, and we were able to then induce the stem cell into a neural cell to make these brain organoids. Uh, and oh, by the way, we've attached those brain organoids to robots and they walk around in their little robot chassis. Um, so we're here. I've been here since 2018. And I'll take you, if anybody ever wants to see the lab, I'll take you, just let me know, I'll walk you in there. So we're here, all right? So we have one, we have one clave of this wild, crazy thing I'm talking about. This is the sector layout of all of the AI startups in Israel, which is just one country. Right? So these are, this is the ecosystem of AI research and startups that are already going down. Highlighted in green is every sector that will influence everything I'm talking about. That's damn near half, if not over half. So again, one country, American is way bigger. The Eurozone is much bigger. Russia is, they fucked up and then I don't think they'll ever recover. Uh, but the Chinese are certainly looking at this stuff too. Because the thing about uh, genomics is actually a data problem. It's not so much a, a chemistry problem, it's more data. So any advancement from here will, will tip the scales into the future I'm talking about in an uncontrollable fashion. Um, and so the instinct is to kind of dig your heels in and say, ah, this is crazy. I want nothing to do. I'm going to fight it. I'm going to fight all this stuff and God damn it. Uh, have a shot at it, man. Try and fight this stuff. You're going to fucking lose. It's a tidal wave uh, of, of incentives. You can have the good fight and make yourself feel good, but you're going to have lizard dolphins, man. <laughs> so what, what, what are you going to do? Um, it's kind of defeatist, but to wrap it up, don't let your memes be dreams. Let your memes become genes. And you're all doomed. So, basically. <laughs> that's it that's all i got sorry for the nightmares folks wow thank you so much pat that was uh quite the journey um all right uh it's 9 35 right now pat are you good to stay for another half hour and a bit mm -hmm. Cool. So this, uh, we're going to switch over to questions now. So hopefully you guys have prepared some. Feel free to throw them in the chat. I'm going to start by warming Pat up with a, with a few of my own. Um, and then I can start reading the ones in the chat. So the one that's uh, top of mind right now is, um, can you speak a little bit more to what you think the timeline for this is? Like, is there a, a Moore's Law equivalent for synthetic biology? Is this going to hit some exponential curve like in the next few years and then it's going to blow up is it a hundred years like you said earlier what's the story it never goes Kurzweilian um, the productive forces behind it will definitely start going exponential the demand for it will go exponential um, but once you break the gene drive of Babel plateau everything plateaus after that 
because you'll be dealing with fragmented societies that are no longer able to communicate with one another. Do you have a, a sense of actual timelines? Based on the Neanderthal work I've been up to. Improvements in CRISPR are on the timeline. The AI is getting better. Um, and again, we're actually able to use the brains we grow to make the AI better too, which is enhancing things pretty significantly. I, I'd look at 50 years easy. 50 years. Yeah. Okay, so this, uh, this segues to another question. It seems like a central assumption for at least the section where you were talking about the economic efficiency curves was assumptions that the economy is going to be fundamentally similar to the way it is today. Mm -hmm. um, do you think we could enter some sort of post-capitalist realm that might change your projections based on that assumption? Someone has the to pay these. Years? I mean, if we're, if we're okay with lining scientists up and chaining them and beating them, um, then yeah, I don't, you don't have to pay them. You can beat the shit out of them. Um, but if you need to, you know, if you need to recoup from your investment, someone has to eat the bill somewhere, whether it's a state entity, whether it's a collective entity, these scientists will be heavy in demand. I don't see capitalism dying. I see these scientists making $500,000 a year, probably more. So they'll be able to command those wages. They'll go wherever there is capitalism, whether it's here, whether it's China, whether it's the fucking moon, uh, they they will find it. Their demand will be too high. Um, I guess kind of a broad like meta question is, do, what's your theory of history? Uh, I come from the Marxist school of thought originally. That's I, I'm, yeah, the, the, the mathematic intellectual Marxism, not the I hate my, you know, I hate my parents Marxism. Uh, I, I, I'm concerned primarily with uh, the, the equilibrium between productive forces and consumption forces. It's the most boring part of Marxism, but it's the only part that I actually take away and, and find interesting. Uh, everything else is just fluff and, and stupid projections that don't make sense. So I look at history that way. That changed when I came across a person's book. He never released the book, which is a tragedy. Um, his publisher was, was too afraid uh, of the content. His name is Gregory Rollins. He's a computer scientist professor at the University of Illinois. He is a Trinidadian immigrant. And he has that 1970s big African man personality, like, ha, oh, oh, ha, you doing it? He's real big and charismatic. Um, and he wrote this fantastic book called The Human Swarm, whereas Marx was trying to go through history and say, hey, um, uh, it's the rich versus the poor. If you look at the scoreboard, it's not. Uh, the, the poor have been beaten soundly every single time. Um, it's actually the rich versus the rich, and, and the poor gets suckered in. So what, uh, what, um, what Rollins says is, he says, well, let's not look through history and blame. Um, let's look through history as if we're all stupid. And that's where he, that's where he puts his position. He says, yeah, we're stupid, we're malice, we're, we're animal-like, of course, but we're also operating primarily from a place of ignorance. And not malicious ignorance, but innocent ignorance. Uh, and so we can, we, can, we can attribute certain things that we don't like in our history to, to the bad things we need to eliminate in current times. He didn't do that. He said, okay, well, humans are making the best assessment they can do with the energy, information, and resources they have. It's anyone's guess what works and what doesn't work. So he looked at it primarily from that point, which was a relief to look at history for the first time without having to find people to blame. So I thank him for that liberation. All right, final question for me before uh, I'll start uh, reading some of the ones in the chat. Um, can you speculate on our salvation? Like, do we need to get off this planet? Yes, get the hell off immediately. As fast as you can, whatever it takes. That's the only answer I have there. All right. I'm gonna start reading some of the questions in the chat. Uh, we have one from Marshall um, that I was asked to read. Is it possible to aerosolize CRISPR? Yes. Uh, right now, it is currently uh, um, the, the transmission uh, vehicle is very unstable, but it can be aerosolized. Um, 
the instability of it, it doesn't get you the results you want, however. That's the problem. So you don't really go for aerosolized approaches unless you're like super close to something. Uh, Rachel, do you want to unmute yourself and read your question? Yes, um, what you were talking about a few minutes ago, do you think that all battles start with petty conflicts of the ultra rich and then trickle down and that we're all just kind of like mechanisms in their affairs when they invite? Yes, I think, uh, I think they're primarily in competition with one another and they are iterating their knowledge of humanity to rope in more and more people with or without their permission. Uh, I think that's probably the most accurate description of uh, their behavior of that particular um, cast of people. All right, uh, Key, do you want to unmute yourself and read your question? No, I'm a little scared to, but I'll do it anyways. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's great. It's actually a lot of fun. When you ask for timelines, I'm like, oh, maybe it already happened. I'm kidding. I'm joking. I'm totally joking. I'm, I'm not really joking. This has been an amazing presentation. Thank you. Um, so can you, I just wrote, can you speculate on the reversal of entropy? And I only asked that because I've always been really fascinated by um, Isaac Asimov's really short story called The Last question um so i just i would love to hear your thoughts on because there was someone else who spoke about like gods of chaos somewhere and i was like that's hilarious um so yeah i'd love to hear your thoughts that is certainly the heart of the matter uh, mm -hmm. we, are, we are certainly enslaved to entropy and it's the only uh people ask me all the time do you believe in a god and i'm like entropy has all the properties that hits the divine so accurately. It's the, probably the only thing that the British Victorians actually put out there that was so goddamn predictive. Um, entropy and reversing it, like that is the holy grail. That's basically what everyone's you know, looking for, that kind of unaccountable future where you get free everything. You don't have to be, you know, you don't have to resolve your conflict at all. That's the dream of reversing entropy, um, at least from the human standpoint. Scientifically, <sighs> You know, I've struggled with it for a long time. Um, uh, the arrow of time, for example, being so predominant, is, is, is it's indicative of, I mean, think of, you know, just run the thought experiment if entropy was reversible. Right? So what you're talking about is symmetrical time. That's really what you're saying. You're saying I can take time in the positive and now I can make it go back to the negative. So yeah. you're talking about purely symmetrical time. So if you have a symmetrical time, then you're talking equilibrium. So any type of positive time event that would happen, there would be a corresponding negative eventual time, and eventually you would hit zero entropy oh. universally. Ooh. Wait, so what does that only, look like? <laughs> but it looks like nothing. Oh, it great. Like nothing. <laughs> it is an absolute nothingness, because there yeah. is no energy. All energy that can happen gets reversed. Huh. So you're talking about any possible universe that can ever ex that can come from a Big Bang. Um, there has to be an asymmetry of entropy. Otherwise, there is nothing. Because all time is reversible. A symmetry of time implies equilibrium of time. So you have to have an asymmetry of time in order to even get this universe. So if we start playing symmetrical time, then, oh, man, that's a, that's a wild world for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, wanna, I look forward to your presentation on that in the future, if you can. Yeah, I'll, I'll see what I can dredge up. Thank nice. you. That's a good question. <laughs> Awesome. Um, I'm going to read a question from Joe. Which current solution does Pat put the most stock in for getting off the planet? Like game B, learning our so source code and developing a warp drive? Any other alternatives? I'm backing something that if game B fails, my thing will work. What I'm proposing is extremely radical. It's going to get me killed one day. I know it. Um, but it'll work. But it's wild. The, the key to getting off this planet is astroeconomics. That's the key. It's not enough to put your faith in scientists and say, oh, NASA is going to solve this problem for me. I'll just go back to my job and wake up one day and space travel will be here. Nope, this is a full contact sport and everybody's required to do something. So 
astroeconomics is the only way to actually do it because you need to create incentive for people to go in the space. And lo and behold, there isn't much incentive. Uh, despite all the crazy shit we do to ourselves, space is fundamentally a desert. Um, there is nothing up there. There is so much nothing up there uh, that even going up there will kill you. Our biology is not well suited for zero gravity. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of incentives to make people give a shit about what's going on up there. So how do you make people give a shit about going into a desert? Turns out we have historical examples to look at. Um, religion was a profound motivator of getting people into a desert. I mean, that is effectively what the beginning of the Old Testament is. I'm sorry, not the, not the beginning of the Old Testament, but by the time you get to Moses, I'm, sorry, I'm going to incentivize a bunch of people to walk in a desert for 40 fucking days. We know how to do it. It's there. Religion certainly plays a role, um, but it's not the only way of doing it. it. turns out that all these asteroids, there's a couple of them that are sitting on 100 million tons of platinum. That's $5 trillion T trillion dollars. How do you get that asteroid? I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I won't, I don't know how to get it, but I'll tell you whoever does get it, uh, that's going to fundamentally change how capitalism looks at their pension funds, how they fund everything, uh, their, their limited partnerships, and their, uh, their outlays of everything. Um, because once $5 trillion suddenly becomes reachable, um, you're not going to fund another stupid dog walker app, that's for goddamn sure. So I believe if you solve the, the astroeconomics problem, you will create the necessary incentives for people to give a shit about space. And the easiest way to do that is to make space labor cheap. But what does space labor look like? Well, we could be space labor if zero gravity didn't trash us every five seconds we were up there. Uh, but I already showed you the Neanderthals. Those are real. There's 6,000 of them. Oh, and we've already sent some into space. Why do we send them into space? Because we want to evolve them to survive space so that they can be the processing units for space labor. That's why we're sending them up there. We'll see how the research goes, but uh, I intend to build a very large fleet. I need at least two, three million, two, three million of these goddamn robots, and I will be able to start grabbing these asteroids and slamming them into the moon and selling them in oil rights. But you got to get the you got to get the incentives all lined up. It's it's about it's still at, at this point it's still about tricking human psychology and getting them into a place where their incentives are solving a problem. So that's my solution. It's wild, crazy, and zany, uh, but I'm backing it. I'm all in. Pat, I keep picking up on the the hints of like Frank Herbert's Dune in the background of your, your thinking. <laughs> that's a, another influential uh, book that I read when I was younger, yes. Yeah, uh, there's a related question here from Dave. Uh, Dave Michaels, do you want to read your question? Oh, Dave, you're muted. Try again. Hi. Yeah, there we go. What's up, man? Where did my question go? I always, uh -huh. already forget what it is. <laughs> also, hi, Patrick. Hey, what's up? Uh, you. You're oh, up. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so uh, earlier you mentioned getting off the planet immediately is the way to, uh, well, I don't even know why you were telling me people to get oh. off the planet immediately, but that was the advice. Yeah. So my question is, so you get off the planet. How does that, uh, and I'm hearing an echo in my own, own voice, so I'm going to take that mm -hmm. off. Um, How does that solve it? Yeah. Uh, the, the societal patterns, the human societal patterns are going to follow that, right? We're, gonna, we're just going to continue going into space right. and going to other worlds, and we're yeah. going to be us, and we're not going to change. Uh, well, That's CRISPR right. is going to change like how we are, and we can survive space and all that kind of stuff, That's but right. we're still going to be humans. The, that, those patterns are still going to be there. Mm -hmm. um, what's the end goal? Right. So um, the, the, the reason why this, the space domain is so important is because if we do not do this, all of our genomes will be homogenized for the sake of hyper-consumerism. We will have either specific genomes for productive capabilities, and then we'll have the rest of the consumer base will have a very specific genome to maximize their consumption behavior. Excuse me. At that point, there is no humans. There's just efficient cogs in a machine that is designed for its own insanity, effectively. Um, this will promote a tremendous 
an absurd amount of resistance. You can't even fathom the level of insanity that this resistance will take form as. Um, and if we continue to play that game on one planet, there is a good chance we will wipe ourselves out from this stuff, whether it's a nuke, whether it's the, the, the capability, we're worried about coronavirus right now. And that's based on data that is barely spooky. I mean, if you look at the numbers, it's barely spooky. Um, but when you start playing CRISPR, where people are intentionally modifying their genome at scale, um, being trapped on a single planet is a recipe for disaster. And so, yes, we will bring our nature with us everywhere we go. Uh, but at least we'll be hedging our survivability by isolating ourselves into different enclaves in the stars, hopefully. And, uh, and I say hopefully, because I know I'm not here to solve war. I'm not here to create a utopian peace like Dalton. I don't, I'm, I'm not that person. I, I want to solve survival first uh, before I start, you know, putting fancy morality in front of it. So uh, I, I believe if you hedge your bets, you scatter across and you put enough distance between people, um, you can start playing this CRISPR game more safely and you have backups. Because once we play this CRISPR game, we're not gonna stop. I think we have cool, time for you. one or two more. Um, Raven, would you like to ask your question? Sure, let me find it. Um, so could CRISPR horror stories have an influence on the rate of adaptation of this technology in the general population, assuming that it's voluntary rather than something that's forced? Um, I guess I have three, technically, and you can pick whichever one you want to do, I guess. Um, is it possible we are approaching gene editing from a perspective that misunderstands the complexity of the genome um, and that early adopters in particular will end up with serious problems uh, potentially later in life? They're all fantastic questions. I'll focus on all three. Um, the marketing, uh, your, your first question was a, a marketing question, uh, which, can do, which can delve into an ethics question as well, uh, in terms of adaptation and frightening people off or accidentally uh, scaring them into it. I've certainly painted a very horrifying picture this entire time, and I've tried to spice it up with occasional bits of black humor. Um, but the it's not going to be initially sold in the horror that I'm presenting, it's gonna be sold as the right thing to do. It's gonna feel good as you do it. You're gonna you're gonna feel like you're doing the right thing as you do it. That's gonna be the most successful. It's it's like when Galton stumbled across it at first. He didn't come around and say, we're gonna fucking breed these pores until they're goddamn machines. He didn't say that. He said, we're gonna fix the public health of the system. Um, so he, 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 learned the, he learned the power of messaging very early on. Um, and uh, I think you'll see horror stories, which are happening now, um, because it is unknown to us. And eventually those horror stories will go away. They'll be antiques and you'll have the, the, the right side of history story dominating the marketing uh, space. But eventually horror stories come back, but they're much more informed and they'll be targeting actual things that people have actually gone through. So you won't be, uh, you won't be trying to put a boundary around the unknown. You'll be saying, hey man, this CRISPR thing, it kind of fucked up this person I know. Um, and then those horror stories become the foundation of political fuel in the future effectively. So uh, gene editing, does it misunderstand the complexity of the genome? That's a great question. Um, the genome is the byproduct of four billion years of winner take all selection. And the level of complexity you have to engage in to maintain your form over those four billion years is beyond fathoming. It's beyond human comprehension for sure. Uh, there is a, an incredible level of complexity. In fact, so much so that a lot of the early CRISPR biohackers are <laughs> getting terrible forms of cancer because it's so goddamn complicated. You mess up your gene once and there you go, stage five auto cancer, you're fucking done for. Um, and those, those reports are being suppressed, by the way. If you dig, you'll find them. Um, so the early adopters, uh, just like, again, I'm looking at CRISPR as a selection mechanism the same way breeding is a selection mechanism. So early adopters, uh, breeding is bloody stuff. It's brutal. The birthing process is painful. The, the mating competition is brutal. Every part of it is, is a very carnal experience. And this will be no different. The, the early adopters will most certainly uh, experience their fair share of, of 
being a loser in the selection game. And some of them will win, but there's going to be a big body count for sure. And that's just purely rooted in ignorance of the complexity of it. All right. We're approaching the end of the hour now. Uh, I just want to thank Pat again for taking us through that journey. Um, I guess one kind of open question for you now is what's uh, part two? What's the next presentation going to be? Oh, yeah. I like the entropy thing because that goes into my other pet projects of quantum gravity that I've been tinkering with for way too long. Um, reversible ent entropy. I was actually at your house, Dave, when I uh, concluded something along those lines. It's ironic that you're here now. Um, I, don't know, I, think I'll, I think I'll toy with that. That might be relevant sooner rather than later. I don't know. Throw some suggestions. Um, I don't know. I'm pretty good on my feet. Who would be interested in the entropy chat? Just to show of hands. Okay. That's pretty good sample. Yeah. I'll jump on that one then. Thank you, Kay, for that one. Appreciate it. All right. Um, just uh, just in closing, um, I just want to thank Pat again. I want to thank uh, uh, Peter for stewarding the stoa. And just a reminder: this the stoa is a gift. Um, and if you feel called to give a gift in return in however way you want, you can do so at a link that I'll throw in the chat. Um, and and that's our. That's our time for today. So thanks everybody for showing up. Thanks, folks. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Dan. Good luck with the nightmares. My apologies. <laughs>